My name is Patrick French. I'm the Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences. And it's really a delight to be able to introduce and open uh, this lecture by my colleague, Dr. Agur Hangarajan, on black holes in Stephen Hawking's universe. And it's a tribute, really, both to his drawing power as a physicist, as a cosmologist, and also the level of engagement between the university and the city and its schools and centers within the university that we have a, a full house uh, here in the auditorium. Uh, anybody who's on the side there, we have got about maybe a dozen chairs down at the front which you're welcome to, to take. So, uh, Dr. Agarangarajan is not only uh, an eminent theoretical physicist, he is also the new dean of the undergraduate college here at Ahmedabad University and he's a professor in the School of Arts and Sciences. And so I think that he at least won't mind if I briefly do an advertisement for the master's course in economics which will be starting in the summer of this year. Uh, we've got uh, I think about a hundred leaflets which when you exit after the lecture you should feel free to take with you. Uh, if you don't want to do a Master's in Economics yourself, starting this summer, give one to a friend or a family member and, and pass it on. Um, also, one other practical matter is that we have a list on a clipboard which anybody who would like to be informed about future events of this kind uh, should take in order to add your name and your email address. If you're a member of the university, faculty or student, or if you already are on the mailing list, you don't need to add it. But if not, and you'd like to be kept informed, then please do, do put it on. Uh, just one final point uh, about the theme of today's lectures, Black Holes in Stephen Hawking's uh, Universe. About three or four years ago, I was taking a flight from Delhi to uh, Paro in Bhutan. And sitting next to me on the plane as we passed assorted uh, very high mountains, uh, which were only sort of just below the height of the plane, um, was Lucy Hawking, the daughter of uh, Dr. Stephen Hawking, who I subsequently had very interesting conversations uh, with and she became a friend, and I think she may even be visiting uh, Ahmedabad University towards the end of this year in order to teach a course within the independent study period, the ISP. She herself is also a physicist, and above all, a great popularizer and a great communicator of science. And I dropped her an email with the, uh, the picture of today's event, and she wrote back, and at the end of her email, she said, it is so wonderful that people cared so much about my father and his work. Thanks for the details of the lecture. It's the tribute that he would have liked best. Raghu Raghu Raghu. So, Hawking was a relativist who worked on 
issues related to Einstein's theory of general relativity. He was a cosmologist, that is, a physicist who studies the physics of the universe. Can we please dim the lights here? professor for 30 years 
from 1979 to 2009. Director of Research at the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics. And slowly, he began to lose control over his muscles. At the time he graduated, he was standing, perhaps using a walking stick. Soon thereafter, he's in a wheelchair. He, at some point, he lost the ability to speak. He had to communicate through a voice synthesizer. Using, at the very end, he was using a cheek muscle, just this, to communicate with his uh, communication, to, to control his communication device. And yet, despite all of this, this would have, uh, you know, doing physics is hard enough. Doing physics when you can barely move is really, really very hard. And despite all of this, he managed to produce brilliant work in, the, in uh, theoretical physics and um, traveled across the globe, had collaborators in many places. Incidentally, he had come to India too for a conference. And he used to go across the world and continue his research collaborating with uh, scientists in many different places. This is with Andy Strominger and Gary Horowitz at the University of California, Santa Barbara. He continued particularly to collaborate with Andy Strominger till the day he died. So what were Stephen Hawking's contributions, his scientific contributions? As I said, there were theorems in general relativity. There was, uh, there was physics associated with the black hole. Uh, particularly Hawking radiation and information loss in a black hole. So before I get to that, I need to give you some background into what general relativity is, what are black holes, and what do we know about our universe. So what is general relativity? General relativity is actually a theory of gravity. It was created almost single-handedly with some help from others by Einstein between 1907 and 1915. And it completely changes the way we think of gravity. When you think of the gravitational attraction between the sun and the earth, what do you say? You have the sun here, you have the earth here. Because of the gravitational pull, let's say it has some velocity, because of the gravitational pull of the sun on the earth, the gravitational force between them, the earth is pulled towards the sun and it goes in an orbit around the sun. Einstein said, no, there's no such thing as a gravitational force. Instead, what he said is that here is the sun. It modifies the space around it in such a way that any object moving in it recognizes this modification of space and then moves in an orbit around the sun. This was a radical idea. Radical in the sense that he was talking about a modification of space. What is space? Space is the arena in which all physical phenomena happen. If you take two electrons and say they, they repel each other, you say I put two electrons here and they repel each other. You don't think of these electrons as modifying the space in which they sit. That's just there, you know, uh, passive. What he said is that no. The mass and the energy of these particles will modify the space in which they sit. In addition, and this is also very important, if these masses are moving or their masses are changing in time for whatever reason, then the space will also be changing in time. So space becomes dynamical. So it's a completely different way of thinking of gravity. Now, we've all studied new. Uh, the standard gravity, which is Newton's gravity in school. So is it wrong? Well, not quite. When do you use Einstein's theory of general relativity as opposed to Newton's theory? So Einstein's theory of gravity as opposed to Newton's theory of gravity. If you want to do calculations very close to a massive object like a star, if you want to do very accurate calculations near some object like the Earth, and I'll say something about that, if you're considering particles moving close to the speed of light, if you want to study the evolution of the universe, then you have to use general relativity. Newtonian gravity will not work. And there's actually a very practical application of Einstein's theory of gravity. We all use GPS on our mobile phones. How does that work? There are three or four satellites in space that are getting the signal from your mobile 
and then they figure out from this signal what your position is. There's a mobile tower in between, but let's just ignore that. Now, when uh, when the the program calculates where you are based on the signals that the three satellites have received from your mobile, they have to include general relativistic effects on the propagation of this electromagnetic wave from your mobile or the mobile tower up to the satellite. If you don't include that, then if you are in the right, if, if the GPS tells you where you are correctly at one particular moment, within about 10 minutes it will be off by about 100 meters. So GPS, Ola would never find you. It's general relativity that's making it possible for Ola to find you. Of course, at Ahmedabad University, Ola will never find you. Because <laughs> <laughs> so, GR works and GR is good for us. But at any other time, for any other situation, you just use Newtonian gravity. So, what do you do in general relativity? Actually, there's a master equation in the theory of general relativity. It's called Einstein's equation. And depending on the circumstance, the physical uh, phenomenon, the physical system you want to study, you solve Einstein's equation for that physical system. So the first uh, system that was studied is the simplest, which is a star. Einstein did it first. Remember, it's 1907 to 1915. Soon thereafter, Carl Schwarzschild does it in 1916. There's a story here. These years, 15, 16, as you can recall, are during World War I. Karl Schwarzschild was sent to the Russian front. He was a physicist, but in those days everyone went and fought. So he was sent to the Russian front. Uh, he, he was in Germany, so he was sent over there to fight. Like any soldier who's getting tired of people shooting at you, he picked up pen and paper and tried to solve some mathematical equations. So what he did, interesting person, he actually tried to solve Einstein's equation in the context of a star. And in fact, he did it better than Einstein himself. Einstein made some approximations. Schwarzschild's is what we call the first exact solution, that is without any approximations, of what the space would look like around the star. And this is referred to as the Schwarzschild solution or the Schwarzschild metric. It is valid not only for regular stars, but it turns out it's also valid for collapsed stars. And a collapsed star is a black hole, as I'll, info, I'll discuss later on. There's another person I would like to mention here, and that is uh, Professor P.C. Vaidya. These, what Einstein and Schwarzschild were studying was just a star, which is, in fact, they didn't think of it as radiating. They just thought of it as a massive object. And you know, you're simplifying things when you first start off with a new theory. They ignored the fact that actually the star would be radiating some energy. It was Vaidya who first showed in first in 1943 and then in subsequent papers in 1951 and 1953 the proper solution for an actual star, which is a star that is giving out radiation. Incidentally, Professor Vaidya has a close connection to this area. He was professor of mathematics at Gujarat University and was also vice chancellor of Gujarat University. The Vaidya metric is a very important contribution in the field of general relativity. The other application of general relativity that we will be interested in today is in understanding the universe. As I'll tell you later, Hubble in 1929 pointed out that the universe was expanding, that is, everything was moving away from each other. Right. All galaxies were moving away from each other. And the theory behind it was done by the Russian Friedman, uh, Lemaitre, who was a Belgian priest, Robertson Walker, who were, I think, both in America, or one was American, the other was in England. And this was done in the 1920s and 30s. You notice here I put Einstein error. In fact, uh, there's not a bad mouth Einstein. I mean, he got something, didn't do it quite right there, and then over here. His first model of the universe actually was wrong. And he finally had to accept that the other people had used his theory correctly while trying to understand the universe. Okay, so that's your brief introduction to general relativity. Now, let me talk about 
black holes. So, what is a black hole? A black hole is actually a collapsed star. So, let's first try and understand what is a star. A star, like our sun, is just a hot or a ball of hot gas. A ball of hot gas. Now, if it was simply a ball of gas, then this ball of gas would have just collapsed under its own gravity. However, at the center of stars, nuclear fusion is happening. Hydrogen is combining, hydrogen nuclei are combining with each other to form helium. Subsequently, helium combines with other nuclei and forms other heavier elements, heavier nuclei. This nuclear fusion that is happening at the center of stars is heating up this gas. When this gas gets heated up, it has pressure. And the pressure of the gas prevents the gravity from collapsing the star. So that's your normal star. But at some point, the nuclear fuel, you run out of nuclear fuel at the center of galaxies, uh, center of stars. Thus the nuclear fusion shuts off. Then you have nothing to prevent the star from collapsing. If it's not too heavy, up to 1.4 times the mass of the sun, it will collapse and form a particular kind of star called a white dwarf, which is about the size of the planet Earth. If it is heavier than that, by the way, that was shown by S. Chandrasekhar, and that 1.4 times the mass of the sun, uh, that limit is called the Ch Chandrasekhar limit. If it's a bit heavier than that, it will collapse further and become what is called a neutron star, which is a very compact object, very heavy but very compact, about the size of a city, 10 kilometers or so, 20 kilometers in size. But if it's even heavier than that, if the mass of the star is greater than three times the mass of the sun, or maybe a little more than that, then this thing just collapses down to a point. So all the mass of a star is now collapsed down to a single point. That's the point where the density now is infinite because you've taken all this mass and divided by zero volume, you've got an infinite density. Another thing was noticed was that around this collapsed star, this point, there was a region around it, some distance around it, where if anything entered that region, let it be a massive particle, a car, a duck, whatever, or light, it would ultimately reach the center and merge with the center. It could never escape. Even if you fired engines on this car or the duck, it would not be able to get out. Ultimately, it would collapse and hit the center. So there is this, there's no physical circle there. It's just there is a region around the central point where it's a point of no return. You cross it, you can never come out of that. This incidentally was shown first in 1938 in Calcutta by B. Dutt and then by Oppenheimer and Snyder in 1939. Interestingly, this paper, even though it was published in a very established journal, Zeitschrift für Physik, which is a standard journal for publishing physics papers, was ignored. Oppenheimer and Snyder in the United States perhaps weren't aware of this work and most people completely forgot about this until it was discovered much later. The reason why you know, it, was, it got forgotten is that that died very young. Soon after he was, I think, a PhD student or just finished his PhD and soon thereafter he passed away. And uh, so he couldn't propagate his paper and let too many people know about it. These were the days before internet, you see. <laughs> so this central point plus the surface of no return, which is called the event horizon, is referred to as a black hole. The central point of infinite density and this hypothetical surface around it which defines the point of no return, that is what we call the black hole. So are there black holes? Is this just something someone's pulling out of a hat? Actually there are many black holes and many of them have been discovered. The center of our Milky Way galaxy, there's a huge black hole sitting there. So this is an artist's impression of our Milky Way galaxy. It has to be an artist's impression. 
We live inside the Milky Way. You can't take a picture of the Milky Way. You'd have to go outside to take it. So it's an artist's impression. It's a, we are living in a spiral galaxy. This is the central region and we have, uh, through our various telescopes, we have taken pictures of the central region. And this is an artist's impression of what it looks like. There's a huge ring of gas there and at the center of it is something that is pulling at it. And by looking at the motion of these stars going around that region, we have been able to conclude that the object, object sitting at that center has a mass which is 4 million times the mass of our sun. But it's in a very, very small region. The rate, okay. Um, so it's highly localized. And with this mass, we know that you can't have it. It can't be a white dwarf that I told you about. It can't be a neutron star at these masses. It must be a black hole. There have been many tests of this region to see could it be something else. And they all point to the fact that this must be a black hole sitting at the center of our galaxy. Remember I told you about the event horizon, the point of no return. For our, our black hole, the event horizon is seven, it has a radius of 700 million kilometers. So it you know, spreads quite far out. Is that a problem for us? Not really. We're in this, our solar system is 0.1 million, million, million kilometers away from the center, from this region. So we're okay. So if this is, this is the center of the galaxy, we actually live on a rock going around a nondescript star at the very edge of our galaxy. That's where we are. Okay? Now, the thing about black holes is there's this point of no return. You cross it, you can't come out. But if you're outside it, it'll just look like some very heavy object there that's pulling you. And as you go further and further away from it, that, that pull will just decrease. The gravitational force will decrease. Or the effect of its modification of space will decrease. So sitting right here, this doesn't affect us at all. And it's not just our galaxy in which we have found um, a, a black hole. Black holes have been discovered in a large, probably a very large number of galaxies. Practically everyone that we look at seems to have what is called a supermassive black hole. That's a black hole that is 100,000 times the mass of the sun. We are a million times the mass of the sun, but they vary. Different galaxies have different black holes, but all of them have this. How were they formed? There are many theories. Most likely something got formed and then it just started sucking in all the stars around it. Remember, our galaxy is about 5 billion years old. So it's a lot of time to suck in material and collide with other stuff and uh, grow with time. Because as the black hole absorbs stuff, it, its mass increases. So that's black holes. And now let me talk about what we know about our universe. So in 1912, Vesto Slipher was looking at ga distant galaxies and noticed that they were all going away from us. Now, how does an astronomer find out that something is going away? You know how when an ambulance is coming towards you, its, freak its pitch increases. When it's going away from you, its pitch decreases. So it's coming at you with, ah, it's going away, it's, ah. Well, the same thing happens with light. If an object is moving away from you, its frequency goes down. If it's moving towards you, its frequency goes up. So what Slipher noticed is, you know, you would expect that galaxies are randomly distributed, some are going away from you, some will be coming towards you. So some of them should have their frequencies raised and some would have their frequency lowered. But what he noticed is that practically all the galaxies, distant galaxies, have their frequencies less than what you might expect which indicates that they're all moving away from us. And then in 1929, Hubble and Humason showed that the speed at which they were all moving away was proportional to their distance from us. And that is called Hubble's law. It's an empirical law. Now, I'm not going to explain how that happens, but this plus this implies that not only for us, sitting in the Milky Way, are all galaxies moving away from us. But wherever you are in the universe, in whichever galaxy you are sitting, you will be seeing galaxies moving away from you. 
the observations were made in for our galaxy. But uh, some amount of reasoning then tells you that it's the case in whichever galaxy you go. That reasoning I haven't shared with you, but it's, it's a consequence of these observations. Now what does this mean? This means wherever you are in the universe, you see things moving away from you. The theoretical understanding of that in the context of general relativity is that space is expanding. These galaxies are not moving away from us because they have some intrinsic velocity. If that were the case, some would be moving towards you and some would be moving away. This is something else that's happening. The galaxies are moving away from each other because the space in between is expanding. As I told you, general relativity says space is dynamic. It can change in time. And there's no conservation of space, so you can just, things can just keep expanding. So, now comes something interesting. Things are moving away from us. So what happens if you go back in time? If you take any region around us and take all the galaxies there and you start going back in time, back in time, back in time, back in time, at some point all of this material will be concentrated at one point. A point of zero volume. So it's a point of infinite density and we know it would happen 14 billion years ago. We know the age of the universe is 13.8 billion years. So, and at that stage, the density is very high. All your general matter will break down into fundamental particles. There are no atoms and molecules. They'll break down into nuclei. Nuclei will break down into protons and neutrons. Protons and neutrons will break down into quarks. So you'll just have these, all these fundamental particles of elementary particles of nature all there together at extremely high density. And one can also show that the whole thing would be moving out very fast. This initial state where the density is infinitely high and everything is moving out very fast is what we call the Big Bang. So that now ends the introduction or the background of what you need to, for me to now tell you a little bit about what Professor Stephen Hawking had done. So I told you he worked on theorems in general relativity with Penrose. He discovered that black holes radiate and that's Hawking radiation. And then he was working on information loss in black holes. So let's now go one by one and talk a little bit about what's the significance of his work. So what I've told you is that the center of a black hole, the density is infinite. So if you just take the equations of general relativity and you have a star that's massive enough, you will conclude using the equations of the theory that you will get a point in later on in time where the density is infinite. If you're using the theory of general relativity and the equations therein to understand the universe, you see that the universe is expanding today. Your equations will imply to you that if you go back in time, you will reach a point, you will reach a time when all the matter is concentrated at a point and the density is infinitely high. Now, in physics, when any physical uh, uh, quantity it becomes infinite, we call it a singularity. And singularities are bad. The idea is that nothing that's a physical quantity should actually blow up and become infinite. What it then implies is that your theory has something missing in it. And if you added that additional stuff, then your theory would not allow for these things to become infinite. So, um, people were grappling with this issue. It looked like general relativity had, had a self-consistency problem. That the, the equations were implying that for a certain set of boundary conditions, you basically get an absurd result. That then things have gone to infinity. So people first started saying, okay, you know, look, these might be very special cases. To understand a star, we presumed it was symmetric, spherically symmetric. Maybe, you know, a, no real star is actually spherically symmetric. You know, you can see flares and all coming out. So maybe if you move to more generic conditions, more general boundary conditions, you might be able to avoid getting a singularity. Again, when we were studying the universe, we made some simplifying assumptions. And perhaps if you don't make those assumptions that the universe is not isotropic and not homogeneous and things like that, you might end up with an initial state that is not singular. 
And that's where Hawking and Roger Penrose come in. Both of them in separate works, but in very related works. So, but this is Professor Hawking, this is Professor Roger Penrose. In separate works showed that if you start with some basic assumptions, some notions of causality, something about the energy of the matter there, that it is positive, etc. With some generic boundary conditions, they showed that the singularity of the black hole is expected generically. So it was not just a special result for a special case. You take any you know, reasonable star with some re more physical boundary conditions, you're going to get a black hole if it's heavy. They also showed that at the beginning of the universe, the singularity that's there, there's nothing special about it. <coughs> you, excuse me, you are going to get a singularity. And these are considered extremely important results. And why? Because they conclusively showed that Einstein's theory of general relativity is incomplete. The theory needs fixing. That was the, I mean, the, the the theory is giving you absurd results, so it must be modified. Thereafter, people looked at in what ways can we modify the theory of general relativity. The most sort of obvious thing was that Einstein's theory of general relativity is an improvement upon Newton's theory of gravity, but it's still a classical theory. There's no quantum mechanics in it. So people said, let's include quantum mechanics in general relativity and come, come up with the theory of quantum gravity. We have done that, for example, with electricity and magnetism. We merged it with quantum mechanics. We got a theory called quantum electrodynamics. So people have been trying to do this. However, so far we have been unsuccessful. You may have heard of something called string theory and loop quantum gravity. These are attempts to quantify gravity in this direction of merging these two. But so far, even though people have been working at it, for the last 30, 40 years, 30 years at least, there has been, uh, we still don't have a final theory, what they call a theory of everything. I should also point out here that essential to the proof of the Penrose and Hawking theorem, theorems uh, is the use of something called the Raichaudhuri equation, which tells if you have a collection of light rays, how do they move forward in time or how do they move backwards in time. The Raichaudhuri equation was given by Professor A.K. Raichaudhuri, who was a professor in Calcutta uh, in 1955. So now let's move on to black holes and Hawking radiation. Our understanding is black holes gobble up everything around them as long as it's close enough. They're 100% absorbers, so you don't expect them to be giving out any light. The stuff around them falling in may be giving out light. But the black hole itself, that is the central point and that event horizon, that region is not supposed to be giving out light. Now, Hawking was thinking about this and he realized one thing. That it is known that when electric fields are very strong, they create pairs of electrons and positrons just out of empty space. So he looked at you got a black hole, it's very massive, the curvature or the, the modification of space or the gravitational effects are extremely strong. Could some effect like this be happening there in the context of black holes? And indeed he found that at the edge of the event horizon of your black hole, pairs of particles will be created. One of them will fall into the black hole and the other one will go out. And so effectively black holes are not black. They radiate. They give out particles. And that's referred to as Hawking radiation. Now, can we detect this Hawking radiation? It would be nice to, for confirmation of this idea. It turns out that the temperature of the radiation, and this Hawking gave it to us, it's, that the temperature is, uh, is a bunch of constants is related to the mass of the black hole. It's inversely proportional to the mass of the black hole. And immediately you can see that we have a problem. Our black holes are very heavy. So the temperature, Hawking temperature, is going to be extremely small. These are a bunch of constants. This is the Planck's constant. Remember we have brought in quantum 
mechanics into gravity. C is the speed of light. Gn is Newton's gravitational constant. Let's not forget, this is the theory of gravity. And Kb is uh, Boltzmann constant. We're talking of temperature, Boltzmann constant comes. I can put in numbers for this and rewrite it in this form. So 10 to the minus 6 times 10 to the minus 8 Kelvin. If you remember, Kelvin is basically centigrade minus 273 into the mass of the sun divided the mass of the black hole. Now, at the center of our galaxy, our black hole has a mass of about a million times the mass of the sun. So this is an extremely small number, multiplying another extremely small number. So the Hawking temperature is 10 to the minus 14 Kelvin, which is practically 0 Kelvin or minus 273 degrees centigrade for the Milky Way black hole. So our, our black hole is radiating at minus 273 degrees centigrade. It's a very, very low temperature. Now, this is the region where our black hole is sitting. As I said, all this orange stuff is gas that is swirling and falling into the black hole. Even if you are one light year away from the center of the black hole, which is beyond the event horizon, this gas as it's falling in is getting heated up and it's at a temperature of 1000 Kelvin. So, from the black hole, the black hole is radiating at 10 to the minus 14 Kelvin and the stuff around it is radiating at 1000 Kelvin. So, as you can imagine, that's the Hawking radiation is completely masked by the other radiation that is out there. So, that's why we cannot see the Hawking radiation. Finally, I'll just say a few words about the black hole information paradox. This is because Hawking actually worked on this for several decades. At different times, he was looking at this problem. It's still an outstanding problem in the context of general relativity and black hole physics. A black hole is defined by three numbers. That's three numbers. Its mass, its charge, and its angular momentum. Whatever other properties of the stuff you throw into a black hole, those properties are all wiped out. At the end, if you throw a man into a black hole or you throw a donkey of the same mass, once it's gone in, you can't tell what fell in. There's no brain coming from outside of the, from the black hole. There's no way of distinguishing. All that will happen is the black hole mass will increase by a little bit. But having gone in, you lose all information of what went in. So this is called uh, the information loss uh, in the context of a black hole. And there are laws of physics that imply that information should not be lost. And so this is called the black hole information paradox. As I said, he revisited this problem at many points in his career. He was working on it even when he passed away. In 2016, they brought out a very interesting, he, uh, Perry and Strominger, Strominger was in that picture I showed earlier. They brought out a very interesting paper trying to argue that on the event horizon of the black hole, there is some information that is stored there. And so the information is not exactly lost. Not everyone agrees with this proposal. So in 2016 and as late as October 2017, they were still working on it and publishing papers on this subject. But um, when it's still in preliminary stages, a lot more work needs to be done on this proposal. So finally, before I end, let me answer this question. Should Professor Stephen Hawking have received the Nobel Prize? Many people ask this. You, know, you say he's such a great physicist, why didn't he get the Nobel Prize? The Nobel Prize can only be given for theories that have been experimentally verified. Hawking made immense contributions in theoretical physics. Our understanding of black holes has increased. Our understanding of the singularities at the beginning of the universe have all increased. But these are not things that you can verify. Perhaps you could have verified Hawking radiation, but the radiation is at such a low temperature that you will never be able to detect it from any astrophysical source. So even though most people believe what he has done is correct, there is no experimental verification of these ideas. And that's why he could not receive the Nobel Prize. However, he did receive all the other prizes that are there in physics because people clearly recognized what he, uh, you know, the value of his work. So, let me now just finally conclude with a quote from Professor Stephen Hawking. However difficult life may seem, 
there is always something you can do and succeed at. Rest in peace, Professor Stephen Hawking.
you know, two things in my mind that comes to my mind. One is that Hawkins always came as a, somebody who walked out of the science departments, physics departments, and it, it appealed to a lot of people across the world. Um, was it something, can you explain a little bit, talk a little bit about what is it about him that, that gave him the kind of popularity that he did, apart from um, did he make a special effort to reach out to this group? And second question is if you can also elaborate a little bit on the event horizon, because I was very fascinated. Um, during the time after he died, there were a lot of obituaries about him, with, uh -huh. where people did talk about the current research around how information loss happens yeah. um, or does not happen on the event horizon. So what is it that makes people think about why, what is it about that particular point um, that's making people you know, make an hypothesis that probably information doesn't get lost? Okay, so the first part was uh, how come he's so famous and well known? See, there are a couple of things. One is, he was a great physicist. But I wouldn't say he was the greatest physicist at this time. He is an, he's probably amongst the top 1% in, in the field of physics, but there are other people like him too. Um, there is a human interest angle here. I think a lot of people admire the fact that he could overcome all these disabilities and still manage to do science at such a high level. So that actually fascinates people and makes people wonder, uh, I mean, to, you know, want to know more about him. The other thing is that Stephen Hawking actually had a sense of humor. And he used to, you know, get involved with, sh I think he's in the Big Bang, what, what is that? Uh, yeah, the Big Bang show. You can tell I don't watch it, but anyway. Um, and uh, The Simpsons, he was, he was fond of it. So he used to work with them and he's a character on that show. Um, he was known actually to be the life of the party, you know, whenever, particularly in his earlier years. So he was someone who reached out to people, he reached out to children through his books. Um, so, and there was this fascinating book, A Brief History of Time, that everyone wanted to read. I must say that it's a bit of a hard read, uh, but, you know, you know, I can see a lot of people nodding, yes, it is difficult to read and to finish it. Um, but, you know, so he popularized cosmology in the way Carl Sagan did it maybe a few decades before him. So that made him, you know, a sort of household name. Um, with regards to information loss, I can't tell you too much because actually no one really knows. What we know is that things fall in and let's say that the black hole finally radiates and it's just radiation that came out. We've, we've just lost all information about what went in. What people have tried to say argue is that maybe the Hawking radiation that's coming out carries some information of the donkey that fell in. But how do you make that radiation to capture that information? People aren't sure of. Since the Hawking radiation sort of originates at the event horizon, this whole thing about information loss and linking it to the event horizon happens. So, uh, Raghu, universe is expanding, right? Yes. So are As we are, speak. So, yeah. are our chances decreasing meeting aliens? <laughs> well, we first presume that the aliens have want to meet us, okay? They could have taken one look at what the human race is doing to Earth and said, okay, let's skip this planet and we move on to the next. Um, the fact that the universe is expanding, yeah, makes things a little further away, but it's not expanding so fast uh, there will come a time when it will be impossible to reach out beyond a certain distance. Okay? That's because the universe is ex accelerating in its expansion. We haven't reached that point yet. Um, I don't know, if, I mean, the, the, there's a lot of space between us and the farthest distance that we can reach. And I'm sure there must be aliens out there. They may not be carbon life forms like we are. They may be more intelligent than us, they may be less intelligent than us. But uh, intergalactic or interstellar travel is difficult and perhaps they haven't figured it out. Or as I said, you know, it's a huge universe. They just missed us, you know, and went somewhere else. Uh, here. Ah, yeah. I just wanted to ask you one thing. Like uh, we started with the Big Bang. Yeah. Now Big Bang must be, it is nothingness. So whatever the radiation or whatever the expansion is in a spherical manner? I wouldn't say it's nothing, it's a lot of matter. Whatever, whatever. Yeah. 
It started from the singularity. Yes. And it expanded in a spherical manner. Yeah. So something spherical with spherical is okay, but cut it. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. So it is at least going away from each other. Yes or no? Yeah. Right. When something is going away from each other, why two particles or anything, whatever, would interact with each other because the angle is always increasing? Yeah. Good point. So, for example, why are you and I not moving away from each other? Okay. If the space is expanding, we should be moving away from each other. The statement that the universe is expanding is based is a global statement that averaging over stars and galaxies, etc. If you calculate, take any two points in that space, they are moving away from each other. The actual universe is not a homogeneous uniform uh, set of particles. Right now, I mean, there's, there's the sun and the earth and this low density in between. So in these regions, it is the local gravity that plays a greater role. And I can explain how the sun and the earth attract each other because of the local gravity and that will supersede the larger expansion of the universe which is at a much smaller rate. And that's why people have calculated the effect of the expansion of the universe on the orbit of the earth going around the sun but it's a negligible effect. But they can get pulled back in because the local gravity can be stronger than what is taking them apart. That was an initial condition that they were moving up. Things come together later. Yes, Professor. What happened at uh, 9 billion years ago? Yeah, 9 billion. 9 yeah. billion years ago that we just started accelerating. What is the physical process could have happened? So, what happened at the time of the Big Bang? We don't know. Oh, after that is, we know everything. <laughs> I'll give you a lecture on it. I mean, that's what I do. <laughs> oh, 9 billion. Sorry. I, I, I'm, at 9, okay. My, my, uh, my error, sorry. Uh, what Professor Singh is asking is, what happened at 9 billion to make the universe accelerate? Um, the, the, uh, the physics of the universe and how it, uh, how the space gets modified with time depends on two things. What is the material in the universe, uh, its density, and what it's made up of. Is it made up of relativistic particles, non-relativistic particles, or something else? Till about uh, 30,000 years from the beginning of the Big Bang, the universe was dominated by relativistic particles. There were relativistic and non-relativistic particles, but more, there were more relativistic particles, and they determined how the universe expanded with time. Between 30,000 years and 9 million years, it was the dark matter in the universe, it's the non-relativistic stuff in the universe that was determining how the universe was expanding. What we have realized is that 9 billion years, something else began to dominate. We aren't sure what it is. There are two solutions to it. One is to add a term in Einstein's equation in general relativity, which incidentally Einstein himself had done years ago, which we call the cosmological constant. You change the equation. And at 9 billion years, this term becomes important. And that causes the universe to not just expand, but accelerate. Uh, but there is another solution. And that is that at that time, in the universe, there was some field. We call it the quintessence field. And its energy density began to dominate over everything else. So the quintessence field, what's a field? Field is like a magnetic field. It's just, you know, you magnetic fields. If you take two magnets, there's something in the space between them that has certain properties. So the quintessence field is something like that and the properties of this quintessence field are such, we call it the equation of state of the field, are such that if you put it into Einstein's equation, instead of a decelerating universe, you get an accelerating universe. We call it dark energy and the dark there represents our ignorance. Yeah. That is a parameter, yes, I agree. Yeah, so what makes so the two uh, issues here, you said what makes it uh, dominate at 9 and that also tells us what happened in the future. If we had all the detail, so uh, it happened at 9, why did something happen at a particular time is a function of the parameters of your theory and in some sense the initial conditions of the universe. It so happened at 9 billion years, it could have happened at another time. It's, it, it's just a function of this cosmological constant, what value it has. If it has 10, 
it will happen at 9 billion years. If it is 15, it would have happened at 5 billion years. So, we don't have an understanding of that. Yeah, and we don't even know whether it's a cosmological constant or a quintessence field. If it is a cosmological constant, I can assure you that the universe will continue expanding and in about 50 billion years, the, all the galaxies would have split apart and this would be a cold place with no stars shining, nothing. Uh, but if it's a quintessence field, then depending on how the quintessence field evolves in time, you know, you can, the universe may remain hot and with stars for billions and billions of years. But that's not a worry for us because the sun will destroy the earth in about four, four million years, so we're gone anyway. <laughs> Sir, uh, there are, uh, yes. yeah. uh, so there are two questions. Uh, one is that you were told that the sun is revolving, uh, the earth is revolving around the sun and yeah. many more planets. So there is a component of tangential velocity uh, sure. for the earth. And there is a gravitational pull also yes. because of the sun which bends the uh, orbit. Yes, yes. So from where does that linear velocity came from of the earth? And our second question is, yeah. I was observing uh, from my Newtonian reflector, the Jupiter, at the night. So uh, there was uh, one side of the Jupiter appeared to be blue and one side of the Jupiter appeared to be red. So was it the gravitational red or blue shift or it was something else? Okay. I'll answer the last part first. No, that is not due to redshift, that's just due to the atmosphere of Jupiter and some processes going on. Okay. We know there's a big red spot, a giant red spot on Jupiter. So if you're seeing that, it's going to appear red. The rest of it will appear a different color. Um, the first question was, how did the Earth get its tangential velocity? So for that, you have to understand how the solar system was formed. Initially, there was just a cloud and it had some velocity. It was going around. At some point, what we believe is there was an explosion somewhere far away. That sent a shock wave and it hit this cloud. This cloud then broke up. The big thing became the sun and it's also rotating. And all the smaller pieces also were rotating and over time they cooled down and that's how they became planets. Because they were rotating, I mean, they had this rotation as well as because they had this angular velocity, they continued to have that. So it's part of the initial conditions of the formation of the solar system. Uh, so sir, uh, I was uh, asking about Jupiter because uh, the uh, I was under, I, w I wanted to understand because was it because of the spin of the Jupiter because uh, one side was coming towards me and another side was no, not. No, those speeds are too slow to, for you to see any redshift of blue shift. Yeah, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.